so Josh is, uh, is a distinguished professor at, uh, he's a chaired professor at, in the Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering and in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at University of Washington in Seattle. Um, and he leads the sensor systems research group there. Um, Josh is fundamentally, I mean, he's, he's an entrepreneur, he's an inventor. Uh, one of the things, Josh, you probably use Josh's inventions, uh, although you may not know it. Um, Josh and uh, Joe Paradiso uh, at MIT, when Josh was in grad school at MIT, at MIT in the media lab, he and Joe um, solved a, a really big problem for the uh, auto industry uh, and the American public, which was uh, he, and, he and Joe figured out how to um, have airbags go off. So sensing and actuating to make sure airbags didn't harm uh, small people, you know, typically small adults or, or children uh, who are in cars during an accident uh, event. And, uh, you know, pretty important stuff. Josh has saved a lot of lives just with that alone, but he's, he's a really quite an inventor. And you're going to hear about a lot of that stuff today. Um, when I, Josh and I first met, he was doing, he was beaming power at, at interesting devices to show that you could light up things remotely and that sort of things so using you know, wireless power. But he'll tell you all about that, but he's gonna be talking about perpetual computing technologies for banishing batteries today. And with that, uh, Josh, you can go ahead and uh, get started. Great. Oh, oh, by the way, one more thing. Everybody out there, um, you're, you're welcome to ask questions during the talk. Um, if you would rather put something in the chat window, you know, I'll keep an eye on the chat window. And uh, I'm Mark Abel, by the way, from Institute for Energy Efficiency, but, but I'll, I'll watch the chat window. And if there's something you'd rather just put in the chat window and have, have me forward it on to Josh, I'll do that. Otherwise, feel free to stop and ask a question if it's appropriate at that time. So Josh, please go ahead. Great. Well, thanks so much for the introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, the, uh, the three Logos you see on the screen here are, are startups that have spun out of my lab. And so some of this work that I'll describe is now uh, being continued uh, by those startups. Um, so as Mark said, I'm coming from the University of Washington. Uh, it's a picture on the left of our old computer science building. And then on the right, we have our, our new. So now computer science occupies both of these. So if there are any uh, undergraduates in the audience, you know, think of applying to, to University of Washington. There's a lot of neat stuff going on here. These are the students who have graduated from my lab over the years. And so you'll be seeing some of their work along the way. And these are the students who are in the lab uh, currently. Um, so a lot of the work that I'm gonna be talking about is, is motivated by sort of idea of the internet of things. So if you have smart connected electronic devices everywhere, um, you know, even in some cases inside the human body, uh, the, the question is, you know, how are we going to power those things? Um, so of course you could use cords uh, uh, like this, but um, you know, you probably don't want ports and connectors, you know, inside your body if you can possibly avoid it. Uh, and certainly they're gonna be a problem everywhere else too. Uh, batteries, uh, you know, have issues with lifetime. There's nothing worse than a dead, dead battery, especially if you have thousands of sensor devices. Uh, and they also add size and weight. Um, so the video I'm showing you here is something I did actually quite a while ago in 2005 or so, uh, back when I was working at, at Intel. And uh, this was what sort of got me started in this, this direction of, of work. So the picture frame like thing you see at the right is actually an RFID reader. It's emitting 900 megahertz uh, carrier. Uh, and then the little stack of boards in my hand, <clears throat> uh, you know, has no battery. It's actually getting all of its power from the radio signal that that reader is emitting. Uh, and it's got a three axis accelerometer. As I tilt it, gravity shows up on the different three different channels, uh, depending on the orientation. There's a little microcontroller running some software, and then it's communicating using a very low power technique that I'll talk more about called backscatter, where this thing, instead of um, generating its own radio signals, it's just reflecting the radio signals that the reader had emitted. Um, so this was something we were able to do for the first time in you know around 2005, 2006. Um, and so at that point, Point, I asked myself, why were we able to do that now? And I'm pretty sure we couldn't have done that 10 years earlier. Uh, eventually, it kind of came up with this plot as, as the explanation. So if you don't look carefully, this looks like a Moore's Law plot. 
Uh, we've got the time and decades on the bottom axis, horizontal axis, but the right, uh, the vertical axis, instead of being a number of transistors is actually how many instructions can you execute with one microjoule of energy? So this is the vertical axis is energy efficiency. Uh, usually in computing people plot the reciprocal of this. And I think it's actually, you know, it, it's a lot less interesting in the sense that you see, oh, the energy, the energy cost per instruction is almost zero and you sort of lose interest. But when you plot it this way, you realize that there's this exponentially increasing resource which is you know, the amount of uh, computation we can do with a microjoule of energy. So if you compare the first electronic computers, you know, ENIAC or something to a, a recent laptop, you'll see that this, this energy efficiency of microelectronics has gone up by a factor of a trillion. And so that's, that's kind of what is enabling this uh, uh, because all of a sudden we're able to do non-trivial things in computing and electronics uh, using you know, amounts of energy that used to be considered so small that they were sort of negligible. Now, the other thing you'll see on the, on the plot is I have the brain on there. Uh, that's, that's not to say that we don't get brains until 2050, uh, but what that's supposed to mean is that if, if, if our energy efficiency scaling continued, um, it would take in, you know, until 2050 or so that we've got to the energy efficiency of the brain. So uh, you know, I take this as a positive. Of course, you hear a lot of talk about Moore's law ending, so you might think that this energy efficiency scaling is ending, but at least we have an existence proof that uh, you know the brain is able to do these computations with still about a million times more energy efficiency than, than we're doing now. So that's the sort of enabling trend for a lot of what I'm going to be telling you about. Um, <clears throat> so that platform that I just showed you is what I call the WISP, um, and so I already gave you the sort of WISP and energy efficiency scaling trend uh, introduction. Um, next, I'm going to tell you a little bit more specifically about backscatter, this very low power communication method, and show you some things we've done with, with cameras uh, that communicate by backscatter. Uh, then I'll tell you a little bit about ambient RF, so harvesting power from TV towers and uh, pre-existing radio signals. I'll show you a, a battery-free phone that uses analog backscatter. Um, and then I'll tell you about some of my work on near field wireless power. So this is ways of sending large amounts of power over short distances. Uh, and that also has applications in implanted electronics inside the body. And then I'll show you some new work on ultrasonic levitation. That's just, I think is really uh, cool and, and interesting. Doesn't necessarily fit into the whole story that well, but um, it's kind of fun. So, um, <clears throat> One of the ideas that's uh, that's enabling uh, us to 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 make you know battery free very low power devices is this idea of um, taking advantage of the kind of asymmetries that that exist in the system. So when you have something like a phone or a low power sensor, it's very energy constrained, but it's probably talking to a, a, a base station that is plugged in that isn't really energy constrained. And so part of the idea is let's take whatever components we can and shift them out of this energy constrained client and move them into the, the wired access point. Um, so backscatter is kind of a way of doing that. Um, so if you think of conventional radio as being sort of like a flashlight, when I wanna send information, I could take a flashlight and I could turn on and off the switch uh, and that would, uh, you know, when the switch is on, chemical energy in the battery is getting converted to light and, um, and I'm modulating that consumption of energy as a way to encode information. Um, backscatter, uh, the idea is <clears throat> if you had a pre-existing uh, source of light, could be the sun or something, or uh, maybe someone else has a, has a, a light source, um, you could send information by uh, tilting a mirror, so just modulating the reflection of light. And, um, you know, at least for the purposes of this analogy, that is, uh, you know, much lower uh, in energy cost than, than actually generating the light yourself. So we're going to do this with radio signals instead of, uh, instead of light. And um, the actual circuit to, to modulate the reflection is very, very simple. It's basically just a transistor that you open or close, uh, a transistor connected to the antenna. So, um, 
you know, if you have an incoming uh, signal, like, a, you know, RF carrier wave, when you close and open the switch, uh, when, when this switch is open, the antenna doesn't really function properly. So the, the wave just keeps going. Uh, when you close the switch, it, it generates a reflection. And so essentially by closing and opening that switch, you can modulate that carrier uh, just like an AM uh, radio transmitter would. Um, so backscatter is, uh, you know, very energy and performance efficient. So in this plot, um, I've got communication rate on the horizontal axis and then power consumption on the vertical axis. So the place you want to be is in the bottom right corner of this graph. So that's the place where you're very high in data rate, very low in power. So the closer you are to the bottom right, the better. And, you know, we've plotted various pre-existing radios out here. Um, and these in red are, are the backscatter uh, uh, radios. So they're they are closest to this uh, optimal uh, corner down here. Um, the other thing I should comment on is these diagonals, these dotted diagonals are the energy per bit. Um, so, you know, a lower diagonal is a lower energy per bit, but that's, you know, not all we care about. We don't want to just have a low energy per bit. We also want to have high bits per second. So that's why you don't want to look at just one of these uh, kind of measures. Uh, you want to look at them together, uh, of both energy efficiency and performance. Okay, so now I'll show you an example, uh, you know, done quite a bit later of uh, um, building a camera that actually communicates uh, using backscatter and, and, and does energy harvesting. So the image that you see here is a kind of descendant of that first board that I showed you in the, in the first video. Um, it has a camera. Um, it was powered, uh, you know, wirelessly by actually that same RFID reader that I showed you in the beginning. The pictures that you see here in the bottom were all taken with this, this device. Um, so this, you know, can take one picture every 20 seconds at about a meter from the reader, one picture every three and a half minutes, four meters from the, from the, uh, from the reader. Um, so, you know, which is obviously not, not fast, but um, uh, that, you know, there's certain applications like surveillance, uh, metering, where, where that may be fine. So in terms of energy, that's about 20 millijoules per frame. Um, so this sort of shows you, uh, when you think about energy harvesting systems like this, um, uh, a lot of times, you know, people ask, oh, well, what's the power consumption of the camera? And that's not exactly the right question. Um, you really have to think in terms of energy. So uh, this is a plot over time of the instantaneous power consumption of the camera. And you can see of, of this whole system, you can see there's a, a large spike up to, you know, 80 milliwatts, um, but that spike is very short in time. So it's only hundred milliseconds wide. Uh, and then, so that's taking the picture. And then this red uh, section where you can see it's, um, it's a lot less than the, uh, the peak, uh, but it lasts for, for a while. So, you know, you have to consider the entire energy to capture the picture and then backscatter it, which is what's going on in this uh, longer red, red region. And then in between these events where you're doing a lot of intense work, um, you're, you're collecting uh, power, you're harvesting power slowly until you have enough um, to, uh, to do something. In this case, the, the energy is stored in a supercapacitor. Um, so that was our first uh, effort at, uh, at a battery-free uh, camera. Um, I had a student named Simon who Mark probably remembers. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so this plot shows, you know, various, various cameras. Uh, so in the top right, you have, um, uh, you know, security camera. These are the similar axes to what I showed you earlier in the backscatter plots. So we have pixels per second on the horizontal axis. So to the right is better, more performance. And then we have power consumption on the vertical axis. So again, we want to be at the bottom right of this curve where we have maximum performance and minimum power. So um, security cameras up here, the image sensors themselves are here. The WISP cam that I just showed you is kind of in the bottom left. Now, <clears throat> if you think about it, by, by duty cycling, by just slowing down the operations you're doing, um, you can always reduce your power consumption. So moving along this diagonal, hopefully you can see my mouse moving. 
um, is kind of trivial. You know, it just, if you slow down what you're doing, you're gonna cut your power consumption. Moving in this perpendicular direction like this is actually difficult. That's, that's what requires you to actually figure out new things. So I said to my students, Simon, you can graduate when you get down here to the bottom right. Uh, <laughs> And uh, he, he actually did it. Um, so his first effort was uh, the analog backscatter camera where he got kind of over here. And then, you know, depending a little bit on how you count things, he actually kind of exceeded some of the, some of the target uh, specs here. So I'll tell you a little bit about how uh, he did that. So, you know, here's <clears throat> a conventional wireless camera uh, architecture. Um, You've got the image sensor, low noise amplifier, analog to digital conversion, compression, communication. Um, and similar to what I showed uh, before that, you know, the idea is take as much as you can out of the energy constrained uh, camera sensor and move it to the access point. So in this case, we left uh, the image sensor, a little pulse width modulator converter, uh, connected to a transistor that, that backscatters the signal. So then we were able to shift the amplifier, the analog to digital conversion and the, the, you know, the compression uh, to, the, to the powered side, to the, to the base station reader side. So here's uh, you know, a video that's is captured in this way. Um, this is, uh, you know, so the first camera that I showed you, you know, we were taking one picture every 20 seconds. Here we're taking you know, one picture are taking something like 10 pictures a second, um, you know, lower resolution. Uh, you can also see there's some pauses where, uh, you know, we've probably run out of energy, uh, but, uh, you know, a lot, lot of progress uh, here. So, um, you know, it's, uh, what does this mean? I think, you know, you can imagine cameras evolving to kind of a sticker form factor with no wires or batteries. Um, you can also, start to put substantial computation into these things, I think that will be virtually free, which means that the camera can potentially trigger on a particular person or event. Uh, you could deploy them much more widely than would be possible today. You could put them inside walls, places that you can't get to, inside containers, gutters, trash cans, anything you might want to inspect, uh, which I think is interesting. I mean, of course, you might need a light source too, but again, with the duty cycling, you can uh, periodically turn that on. All right, so that concludes the section on, uh, you know, far field wireless power where we're deliberately transmitting uh, power signal. But one thing we realized as we were doing this work was that um, the image you see on the left is actually a TV tower that's in the middle of Seattle, uh, and it's putting out a megawatt of, of RF power. So we realized that, you know, from a few kilometers away, you actually get the same amount of power that an RFID reader is, is giving you at you know, 10, 10, 10 to 15 feet. Um, so we took a commercial TV antenna, added a little rectifier harvester, and then I was able to power this kitchen thermometer uh, that I literally pulled you know, out of my, my kitchen uh, using this pre-existing power. So the map you see on the right shows that approximately where that TV tower is and, and about how much energy you'd be able to harvest at different distances. So we've got 100 microwatts out in kind of the University of Washington area. And if you go another few kilometers, you can uh, still get 25 uh, microwatts. We also looked at doing this for cell phone uh, towers. So uh, the picture in the top here is the University of Washington campus. And, you can see that there are some cell phone antennas on top of that kind of castle-like building. Um, and we were able to you know, harvest uh, at a bunch of locations nearby. So these on the picture on the right, you see a bunch of green uh, circles. And at those locations, our, uh, our harvester was able to operate from this power source. Uh, the red ones, it actually did, did not work. And I think it's not the distance. I think we actually were getting a multipath reflection off of this uh, fountain. Uh, here in the middle. So one of the things that we realized next was this idea of backscatter communication, we can potentially apply to these same pre-existing radio signals. So the devices you see here are powered by the, the TV tower, uh, just, just, just like in the other uh, example. 
But what we're gonna do now is have these things talk to each other by reflecting the pre-existing TV signals. Um, and you know, that, that uh, is, is something people hadn't done before as, as far as we know. And, and so this, this generated a lot of interest at the time. So the device that I showed you, the green board right there has some RF power harvesting, uh, uh, circuitry to receive signals sent by another one of these units, a little microcontroller, um, we put some buttons on there uh, and then the backscatter, uh, you know, the actual hardware is actually very similar to what we needed for the RFID tag. Uh, but it turns out if you do the right averaging and so forth, you can communicate with these pre-existing uh, data signals. So I'll show you a little movie here. Uh, so in the background, there is a TV tower you can't see. Um, and the idea here is that these devices are something like a credit card with some stored value, and we're going to exchange data between them, uh, uh, exchange value between these things. I suppose I should say it's your Bitcoin, which, uh, so you're, okay, so the one of these devices, we're now bringing it up to a powered reader so we can read its initial state. So it's got 110, I'm going to call them Bitcoins, why not? Uh, oops, shoot. Okay, so initially um, we had 100, now we're bringing another one in uh, and transferring <clears throat> some value. Let's see, okay. Sorry, I had a playing problem there. Okay, so now there's 130 stored in there. So these things actually exchanged messages, did a um, CRC to validate it uh, and so forth. And then here we were sort of thinking about, well, what else could you do with this? So visualizing some applications. Um, so, you know, there are all kinds of things that you tend to lose, like your keys, remote control, wallet, glasses. You could put tags like these in, in those, and then also a similar uh, reader device in the uh, sofa. Uh, and then, you know, the couch can figure out that you left your keys there if you went away and the keys uh, uh, stayed. Um, using this sort of peer-to-peer -peer communication. And of course, you can build these into, into walls uh, and places that you never need to access again because they don't, they don't require a power source. Um, so this shows a little bit just about you know, how, how you receive the data. Um, so if you were to look at the original TV signal with the backscatter superimposed on it, you, you really can't see much, but um, you know, if, if you do the right sort of averaging and so forth, you can extract the digital messages. So uh, another thing that we did uh, taking this further was actually created a phone that is, that is battery free. Um, and the interesting thing is that this, you know, is all pieces that have been demonstrated, you know, for other purposes uh, previously. So, um, <clears throat> for sending speech. So, you know, phone needs to be able to receive speech and transmit your own speech. So for sending speech, that's essentially just a, a crystal radio. Um, so, um, well, actually, yeah, I guess I, I reversed my terminology. So for sending speech from the phone, we're gonna do analog backscatter. So um, <clears throat> rather than just in the previous examples, I've showed you digital backscatter where we just have a switch that's open or closed connected to the antenna. Now we're going to use the microphone to modulate the connection of the antenna to ground. And so basically, uh, the reflection coefficient of the antenna is going to be proportional to uh, the voice signal coming from the microphone. And then to receive speech at the phone, this is going to be similar to a crystal radio. So the uh, source is going to just modulate uh, instead of just a straight carrier, we're going to modulate the audio uh, onto that carrier, and then um, we're going to rectify it and play it to, to the user. So here are the blocks that we put together uh, for this. So we have a microcontroller, we have the RF harvester, we also added some uh, photo, uh, you know, photo diode harvesting uh, as an additional source. Uh, we have uh, <clears throat> some circuitry to receive digital signals from the reader. So that's for sending commands and things to the, to the phone. Um, we have a, an earpiece speaker uh, for, the, for the user to hear the audio. We have a microphone. Um, 
and then we have, uh, you know, we have the ability to do both digital and analog uh, backscatter for the for the communication. Then we have some some capacitive touch inputs and LED coatings. So here's pictures of the front and back side of this uh, uh, device. You can see the buttons at the bottom left, uh, antenna at the top. This yellow block on the right is the earphone jack. Uh, microphone is on the other side. And now here I'll show you a video of this. Here we demonstrate the RF powered battery free phone. To place a call, the user dials the number using capacitive touch buttons. The phone uses backscatter to transmit digital packets to a base station. A custom base station receives the digital packets and connects to the dialed number using Skype. On the other end, the recipient picks up the phone and answers. Hello? The battery free phone receives the signal using zero power amplitude modulation and plays the audio on the earphones. To talk, the user pushes a button and speaks into the microphone. The audio is transmitted using zero power analog backscatter. With the battery free phone, you never have to worry about charging your phone ever again. So that was uh, kind of fun. Uh, you know, I don't think that obviously we're, we're going to have, uh, you know, battery free phones, uh, but what I do think would be useful and I, I could really imagine having is, is just that your phone, you know, when you have power, when you have charged battery, it's going to use that for playing games and sending emails and browsing the web, stuff like that. But uh, even if you completely run out of power, uh, you may still have the ability to, to, to make a call or send a text, do some of those uh, very low end things. Um, so uh, that is the end of the kind of low power uh, section of this talk. Uh, so, so Josh, do you want to pause for a second and maybe see if there's any questions? And then yeah, sounds like a good idea. Anybody have any questions, the burning questions they want to ask now? Or we'll wait till the end. I can just keep going. Um, and if you think of it, put it in the chat. So uh, yeah, so everything I showed you so far is, is, is about small amounts of power over relatively large distances. Now I'm gonna show you uh, work on transferring large amounts of power over short distances. So this is, uh, became my first PhD student, a Lancet sample, and he's in this video powering a 60 watt light bulb from a couple of feet away. Um, and the way this works is we have the transmit side has a high quality factor resonator. The receive side also has something similar. Um, and if you think about a mechanical analogy for this, um, this is like two coupled pendulums. So, you know, coil, the transmit coil is like one pendulum, the receive coil is like another. And the magnetic field that is linking them together is like a spring that's coupling these two pendulums. And so a system like this has two normal modes or you know, two resonant frequencies, um, one in which the coil currents are going the same direction and the other in which they're going opposite direction, they're, they're anti-phase. And the frequency of those two modes is, is different. Uh, and as you couple these things more strongly, so as you stiffen that spring, um, uh, the, the difference in resonant frequency, the, the resonance splitting increases. So you can see that in this plot. Um, so the horizontal axis on the right is frequency. Um, the, the left axis down in front is, is coupling coefficient. So basically uh, related to distance. So the sh close distance is the, the, this area over here where I'm uh, moving my mouse and then long distance between the transmitter and receivers over here. And the vertical axis is, is essentially uh, you know, the efficiency of power transfer. So if you look at this sort of V-shaped plateau, what this is showing you is that, um, you know, as the transmitter and receiver change distances, um, if we pick the right frequency, we can transfer power with very, very high efficiency. Um, and when we first made this plot, it was, it was kind of counterintuitive to us because I think we and a lot of people, when you think about wireless power, think, well, the further away the receiver is, the less power you're going to get. Um, 
And that is true once you're kind of far away. But uh, what this showed is that there's a regime where if you, you know, adjust the system properly, uh, there isn't this trade-off between distance and power. You can actually uh, send a constant uh, efficiency power without, without uh, losing anything because of distance. Um, so, um, so, wait, so wait, Josh, can you explain that a little more? Like that does seem counterintuitive if you haven't thought about this, right? Yeah, I mean, basically it, it, the way it ends up working is that if you, well, if you, if you tune the system properly, there's a regime where you can get, you know, constant efficiency. Uh, and then once you move out of that regime, things start to fall, fall off. And, so uh, if you're at the right frequency and then you could, I mean, all of that sort of stuff, given the distance, given the, I mean. Yep. And so I'll show you a little more. So, so here's a video. So in this video, in the first section, we're going to have no auto tuning. So we're going to just leave the frequency constant and you'll see that the light bulb, when it gets too close, it turns off. When it's too far away, of course it's off. Uh, so when it's off and too close, that means we went down the backside of that V-shaped plateau. Uh, in the next section uh, of video, I'm gonna turn on auto tuning where now it's gonna automatically pick the best frequency. And so this is gonna keep us on top of that V-shaped plateau. And so now, you know, I can change the distance kind of any way I like, and I can, I can also, change the orientation and we, we just maintain constant efficiency. And then this is another sort of cool trick you can do with this. Um, here's a unpowered relay and the power gets kind of regenerated uh, and, and uh, goes further than it could. You can also use it to sort of turn corners as well. Um, I'll show you more of that uh, actually right, right now. So um, in the multi-hop videos I just showed you, the orientation of the coils was like this, but now I'm gonna turn them. And so we've got one uh, powered transmit coil in the middle, and then a bunch of uh, these relay coils all around it. And the LEDs are indicating which one is energized, which coils are energized. So you can see there's three coils uh, energized at a time. So the power is multi-hopping uh, from the center to the middle to the edge. And then we're scanning around just to increase the area over which uh, the power is delivered. So if you saw Apple actually came out with a charging pad recently that was supposed to do what this does. Um, you know, you're supposed to be able to put multiple things on it. And they ended up actually withdrawing their product because they couldn't get it to work uh, unfortunately, but um, you know this this approach actually does work. Uh, so what I showed you there was slowed down just for um, visualization, but you can actually run it much faster. So now I'm doing the same thing, scanning in that same way, but it's just faster than you can see. So now it's as if we've got this entire large area uh, that's 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 powered. Another kind of neat thing you can do instead of scanning the power everywhere is we can actually detect when uh, power is being absorbed. And so uh, in this case, we're not, we're not delivering power everywhere. We're, now we're scanning, but then um, it's figuring out where the power is, is being collected and uh, only rooting the power to those locations. Hey, John, did you have a question? All right, sorry, Josh, go ahead. Okay. All right. So uh, my PhD student, Ben Waters, who did a lot of this work uh, on, on wireless power, uh, and I co-founded a company called Wibotic to commercialize some of this high power wireless power stuff. And so uh, they're focusing on wireless charging for robots. Um, so in this application, you can see a drone, um, uh, there's actually a lot of interest in data centers for this because people want to have robots in their data centers, uh, uh, being able to do things autonomously. And, and so how's the, if it's really going to be autonomous, how is the robot going to take care of power? So this, this method uh, seems to be uh, you know, pretty attractive for that because making mechanical connections is, is unreliable. Um, the mechanical connectors tend to wear out. Uh, and uh, this allows means that the robots just have to get in the right general vicinity and then they can 
uh, transfer power, recharge themselves. We actually just got a big grant uh, with Na from NASA. Uh, it's joint UW Wibotic Astrobotic uh, to do wireless charging on the moon. So the idea is you'll have these small rovers uh, that um, you know can move around and um, get wirelessly recharged from these fixed uh, landers that are much larger, have large solar cells, large batteries, and uh, the rovers can come up uh, and recharge. So this is uh, so NASA tipping point public-private partnership. Uh, do you know, Jay Josh, do you know how they're doing the per Perseverance uh, uh, drone? I mean, how they're gonna repower that or anything? Well, I know that the main thing is, is nuclear power. Uh, I, I, I don't know if they, I don't know if they have a way to recharge the, uh, the drone itself. I think, I think maybe it just does its four flights and that's it. Uh, well, you would think, I mean, I would think they would have put, you know, I mean, do some solar or, or just come back and get recharged or something, but yeah. Okay. Whatever. I, I mean, yeah, may, maybe they are, but I think they're only planning four flights or something. That seems like a waste, but all right. Anyway, they needed, they needed your technology. For perseverance yeah well this this is we're taking the technology to the point of it's ready for space and then uh uh you know we're hoping to use this something called the commercial lunar payload system that uh you know hopefully will get us uh to space you know with a further grant after that but you know astrobotic is the prime and these guys just got a 250 million dollar contract from nasa to actually put stuff on the moon so these, these people actually know how to send stuff to the moon, which is really, really fun. Um, another kind of interesting project with Wibotic uh, from DARPA, uh, here the idea is to recharge, de demonstrate that we can recharge drones from pre-existing uh, RF sources. So something like a cell tower, you know, typically I said, we're, you know, we're only in the area of 100 microwatts or something, but the thing we realized for drones that are operating in enemy territory, let's say, is they can potentially get very, very close to the antennas. So that's the thing that we're exploring in this project. Uh, you know, the, the drone could go right up to a TV tower, right up to a, a cell phone tower, maybe to a power line. And uh, since they can get so close, maybe we can uh, uh, harvest more, more power. And it, it brings up some interesting antenna questions because it's such a weird situation that I, people haven't really thought about those antenna questions before because it's just such an odd application. All right, so uh, another interesting set of applications for this stuff is uh, implanted electronics. Um, so this project is actually, uh, believe it or not, the Department of Defense has something called the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program. Uh, uh, so this is a grant to try to improve breast cancer treatment by creating a uh, injectable device. So uh, something small enough to fit inside a syringe, which is 2.1 millimeters on the inner diameter. I wouldn't especially want to be injected with that, but uh, I guess it's better than surgery. Um, so uh, these things are going to be, you know, fully powered externally by, by you know, HF, uh, you know, radio signals, just like just like I've been showing you, and they do uh, optical sensing of uh, of term, tumor growth. All right, so that um, also finishes the uh, the wireless power section. So I'll do another quick check to see if there are any any questions. All right, so the next uh, section, <clears throat> you know, it's interesting. Uh, ultrasonic levitation is, is, a, is a new kind of area. And there are quite a few people who work on wireless power who've also started to work on this. And I, I think it might be for, for two reasons. One is, you know, in wireless power, you're taking these invisible RF fields and trying to do things that are, you know, sort of macroscopically observable in the, in the physical world. And, and this has that character too. And then there's also just the practical aspect of it, which is you need to generate, you know, very strong signals that, uh, you know, are a lot larger than people are normally used to dealing with. And, and so uh, that may be why uh, people do this. So um, the image that you see on the left is an array of ultrasonic speakers, and there's a little uh, piece of styrofoam floating in, in there. 
uh, in the middle. And in this video, you'll, you'll see that uh, more clearly. Okay, so there's the little speck. Uh, and we're going to uh, turn on this array of speakers. Actually, uh, you can see now they're moving together, but over the table. Um, and uh, <clears throat> here the student puts this little lid on. We don't need to do this anymore, but this was in the early days. You needed to do that as a way to pick things up. Now that, it's, now that the object is lifted off the table, uh, we can get rid of that. It sort of changes the ultrasound field in, in the way you need to lift it up. Okay, so now this object is, is floating. Um, and here he's showing no strings attached. Um, all right, so what's going on is uh, the ultrasound uh, is creating a standing wave and uh, that creates some acoustic radiation force. Um, and basically, actually depending a little bit on the, the ratio of the material properties, you know, the material to the medium that it's in, um, those particles will collect either at nodes or antinodes. Uh, so in practice, they're, for most objects we're gonna encounter, they're going to uh, collect at these nodes. Um, so let's see, I'll, I'll just move along here. Um, so there's a, you can write down an acoustic potential called the Gorkov potential. Uh, it's an approximation, but it gives us an idea of what's going on. And it depends on both the pressure of the sound and the velocity. And um, so given that potential, you can compute a gradient, which tells you a force. And then here in this picture, I've plotted the, uh, the, the potential. So um, essentially, if you've got a, a kind of a minimum in the potential that is above the surface, uh, you know, an object is going to, is going to be attracted there. So here, here's a plot of, of force uh, uh, above the table surface, and you can see there's a kind of, you know, all the force arrows lead to this, uh, uh, this place that is, you know, above the table surface. So that's, that's going to be how we're lifting things up. So in this picture, uh, I'm showing different things that we've lifted, a small plant, uh, an insect, an integrated circuit, un unpackaged, uh, little potato chip fragment. Um, now, one question we asked ourselves is, can we lift things off of the tabletop? And because uh, that's a very, very important, if you want a robot or something to pick something up, you're going to have to lift things off the tabletop. Um, we realized we could use a method of images to understand what does a tabletop do to, to acoustic uh, signals. So if you remember from your, your electromagnetics course, if you want to understand what happens when you have a charge above a grounded surface, you can get rid of the grounded surface and replace it with a mirror charge that's you know, opposite the surface uh, and opposite in charge from the main charge you're interested in. And that, those will give you the same fields. And we can do that in this acoustic case too. So if I want to know what happens to a speaker that's over a rigid table surface, um, I can get rid of the table and then add this mirror source below that is opposite in phase. And um, you know, the table doesn't, air can't penetrate the table. Uh, so the velocity uh, at that boundary has to be zero. And, you know, we get the same boundary conditions from, from this setup. So, uh, so now if we want to lift an object off the table, our first idea was, well, let's just put a ring of uh, transducers around the object on, this, on the table surface. And so we tried that first. And what actually happens is that instead of the object getting lifted off the table, it gets pinned to the table, it gets pushed down. Um, and in that video that I showed you, when we put the plastic lid on, that actually changes the field in such a way that it lifts up the object. So um, this shows, you know, there are two uh, rings of transducers here. Um, but what we want to have happen is something like this, where the minimum in potential is above the table surface. So it turns out if we add more of these transducers up high, we can actually shift the, uh, the, shift the field in such a way that uh, we can lift the object. So we actually built something like that. This is a ring of four transducers. Uh, this is my PR2 robot that's holding it. So we're going to use this to lift objects off the table. So 
in the center of this ring, you can see there's a little flower that's being levitated in front of the robot's eye there. Um, so in this video, there's a little object on the table. Uh, the levitator is coming down. Um, you know, obviously the full robot is, is holding it. Field gets turned on. Um, skip ahead a little. Oops, let's see. Oops. Okay. So by turning on a sequence of these things, uh, it can lift the object. Then it looks at it to see which color it is and uh, sets it down. You know, if it's red, it's going to put it in the red container and blue, it'll put it in the blue container. So this is something people hadn't done before. It showed that you can actually pick up objects off the table with uh, this acoustic levitation method. So this just shows you in a little more detail the sequence of activating these, uh, these rings. So the little red dot that you see, say, in A, under figure A, is uh, the object sitting on the table. When you turn on the first uh, set of transducers, it comes up partway. Um, Adjusting the phase a little bit, it, it goes up a bit higher. Turn on the upper ring, it, it comes up higher. And so with this sequence of action activations, you can, you can get the object to lift up. Now, another cool thing you could do is adjust the phase of these things and actually control the position. So if you look on the right, you can see this little object going up and down. And then on the left is the computer screen where we're commanding, we're just, you know, commanding where we want the object to be and uh, computing the right phases for these transducers and, uh, and using that to uh, adjust the object position. And then here's kind of a close up. This is a horizontal configuration. Uh, so we just took the whole apparatus and turned it on its side and uh, we're, we're adjusting the position of the object by just changing those phases. All right, so, um, one of the applications we're thinking about with this is, is, is microscopy. So we have a microscope looking down on this object. And um, uh, you know, one of the things about non-contact manipulation is there's no occlusion. So the microscope can see the object well. Uh, and you know, there, there are a lot of other attractive features too. Some people have pointed out that for spectroscopy, a lot of times if you have a sample in a glass container or a plastic container or something, uh, you're going to see signal from, from the container itself. But here there is no container. Um, so, so potentially that could lead to uh, cleaner spectrographic signals. And you know, we think there are a lot of other applications as well, of course. All right, so I'm just going to wrap up there. Uh, Key message, I'm sort of focusing on energy efficiency uh, messages here, because uh, that's, that's your interest. Um, so Moore's law based improvements in, in energy efficiency of microelectronics mean that it's becoming possible to create battery free perpetually operating devices. Um, that's been one of the fun things for me about working in this area is you, know, you think of something you can just barely do and you show that it works and then a few years later, it works quite a bit better. Uh, and that process keeps continuing. So it's nice to have things where the research gets more useful and more impactful uh, as these energy efficiency scaling trends continue. Um, another sort of idea that we were making use of was, was asymmetric design. So shifting as much functionality as possible from the energy constrained wireless endpoint to the wired infrastructure. Saves, saves a lot of power for the endpoint device. Of course, if you're looking at it from a global perspective of energy efficiency, uh, you know, it's, it's not, not as clear uh, that that's a benefit, but uh, that's an interesting question. Um, revisiting analog can save power in some cases. That's one of the techniques we used. Um, an another big takeaway that we're trying to get out there is the idea that backscatter communication, which was originally developed for RFID, uh, should be used you know, a lot more broadly. Uh, we think that's an opportunity that's being sort of left on the table by the research community. And so finally, where we see this going is uh, making battery-free protect and perpetually chargeable devices uh, a reality. I'd like to thank the sponsors and uh, happy to 
take any questions now. So Josh, you a, go ahead, John. I had a question. In terms of like communicating between two devices, is it better? I would think it'd be better to retransmit than it would be to reflect and modulate. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it, you know, it depends on what, it depends on what your assumptions are about, you know, where you're allowed to spend energy. Uh, I think where this makes sense is if, if you assume that there is uh, a wired source uh, somewhere, which, you know, usually there is, uh, then, uh, you know, for the, then for the energy constrained devices, it's, it's better to reflect. And I was just thinking with, with multipath and with, you know, a, a lot of interference, I, I would think it might be better to choose a particular frequency and look for that frequency in the receiver, and, you know, and sort of have a dedicated uh, transmission, you know, just the data, you know, from device A to device B. Yeah, well, you know, again, if, if it turns out you can, you can save a lot of energy, uh, you know, for the, for the endpoint devices this way, um, uh, you know, there's still, as far as frequency, I mean, there's still frequency selectivity and so forth. Uh, so there's still a, a designed frequency. Well, usually there's a, some sort of design frequency for what are you reflecting? Um, and so, uh, yeah. And then, there, there are a lot of interesting questions about, you know, the full system design, what sorts of things uh, uh, you can do. But, you know, generally speaking, if you're, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, how do I get information off of a device like this, uh, you know, off of an energy constrained device, you're going to do a lot better using reflections than, than active transmissions. Okay, very cool. Very nice. Thank you. So, um... Well, while we another other questions? Uh, yeah, yeah, I have a question. I, I can remember from the high school days with someone who did try and do your energy harvesting by taking uh, antennas and taking all the power from a, a transmitter. And then, of course, there was a dead zone from everyone else trying to watch TV or radio from behind him. <laughs> so, yes, they got the power, but they did get nailed for stealing the power. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that raises a lot of a lot of interesting questions. I mean, I think you you know, typically, uh, if you're you know receiving the power, it's not uh, any different than than you know any other user. Um, uh, but but that does raise some interesting questions. Of you know, you can imagine having systems where you actually pay for wireless power, um, and uh, you know, clearly it would be hard to enforce in some ways, but you can definitely imagine things where if you're a paid up subscriber, you're able to harvest power much more efficiently than if you're just trying to kind of pirate uh, power. Uh, and of course the, the power seller, whoever that is, could also coordinate among all the users uh, to make sure that uh, you know, everybody gets the amount of power they're, they're supposed to be getting. But your drone example the, for, the, for the military is an example of stealing the power completely. Yes, that's right. And that one really, I think, probably only makes sense in the military context where you assume the infrastructure you're stealing from is enemy infrastructure, where it's actually good that it stops working. Um, yeah, that's probably not something you could do kind of domestically. Uh, just an aside, uh, one of the uh, folks on, uh, Stan Roberts, said that uh, back to the Mars uh, Perseverance rover, um, the, the helicopter, the, uh, the, the, the drone um, is solar powered, he said, and uh, recharges independently of the rover. And, uh, and they expect the flights to be um, about 90 seconds each till it has to recharge or whatever. So. I see. Yeah, and I guess they, I mean, they, have a, they have a tradition of exceeding their specs by a lot. So they only promise four flights, so they'll probably do hundreds. <laughs> right, right. Other questions? Uh, please. Okay, J Josh, I have one. Um, so back, you know, I was thinking about, so we, we actually have some of our projects that are done out in agricultural fields, um, you know, where there's, there's sensing going on, there's, there's 
so certain cases with the actuating and all that. The power is very expensive to get out there and all this sort of stuff. But I just wondered if you thought at all about the agricultural applications of any of the stuff that you've done. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very interesting space. Um, I personally haven't done much work on it, but um, I have a student named Zarina Kapitanovic. Um, she's going to be on the faculty market in the next year or so, by the way. Uh, and uh, she has done a lot of work on this, um, mostly in conjunction with Microsoft. Um, so that Microsoft has a project called Farm Beats and uh, run by Ranveer Chandra, who's a kind of networking person. In fact, he's just taken over the networking group at Microsoft Research, taken it over from Victor Ball. Um, and uh, so they've done all kinds of, of stuff uh, uh, and, 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 you know, we're, Zarina is hoping to, to demonstrate some sort of ambient backscatter or derivative of that, uh, refinement of that um, for, for the agricultural application. Yeah, so I, I think that's potentially very interesting. Um, and also, I mean, the idea of having drones that recharge themselves and uh, you know, survey agricultural fields is also uh, of interest. Um, I mean, the whole drone inspection uh, area has been, uh, hasn't really been possible yet because of uh, federal regulations haven't sort of caught, caught up. But, but actually the first company just got approval to do so-called beyond visual line of sight operation of drones. Um, so until, that, until the FAA issued that waiver, the rule was you had to have a visual line of sight to the drone. The pilot had to have a visual line of sight. So now they're able to operate further away from the pilot. The next step would be autonomous where there is no pilot. And then once you have that, this autonomous recharging really makes sense uh, because you know, if there's a person around who can pilot it, they can also change the battery. But if there's, you know, if you want a drone operating at a field to just live there, go out and inspect the field every day without a person babysitting it, um, um, you know, that's when the, the power story makes sense, the recharging story makes sense, but you need those, those regulations. So it seems like that's coming, but it's not quite here yet. Yeah, by the way, the, the name of the project is Smart Farm. Uh, and they, 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 we coined that, other folks have grabbed it and stuff, but, uh, but uh, uh, Rich Walski and Chandra Krintz in our computer science department have that program with some of our local, California is a large ag industry, of course. And, uh, so if you want to take a look at that or have your student take a look, might be some intersection there. Yeah, definitely. I definitely like to learn more about what they're doing. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Uh, all right. So other other final question or two from anybody? We're kind of at the top of the hour. Hey, Josh, as always, this was uh, fun and fascinating and it was great to see you again and uh, I appreciate you, your, your stuff. Any, any final questions before we let Josh go? Okay, we've got a number of thank yous and so forth for you, but uh, thank yeah. you, we appreciate your time. Thanks so much, and uh, yeah, hope I'll, I'll be able to visit there in person sometime. In the next yeah, year. yeah, we'd love to have you down here next time you, you know, uh, you're heading down this way, you know, after post-COVID COVID world, you know, next school year or whatever, uh, look forward to seeing you. Great. So, Thanks, maybe Josh. I'll... Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Josh. Thanks for your interest.